Yeah. Yeah. So Louise, thanks for joining. We're talking about wake up stories. And <clears throat> before we got started, we were, Louise was telling me about some wake up stories. So why don't we just continue down that line? And, you know, the idea is that, you know, people aren't alone. They might feel like they're alone, but talking about when, where, and how people <clears throat> came to see things differently and see things differently from their peers or their coworkers or other people that they're around will let the idea is to let people know that they're not alone out there and to bring these things to light, to bring people together and to see reality as closely as we can. Yeah. Yeah. You know, thanks. It's always, it's, we don't talk all that often, Tim, it, it seems like, or I, I really enjoy whenever I, I get a chance to talk to you. So when you said you had this question, I got really excited because it's something that I'm I've, I'm always very uh, curious and wondering about others. So uh, as I was telling you earlier, before we, we started, uh, I've got a local group of, I call them my little group of rebels. They're a little bit like autonomy in the flesh, kind of, sort of, but, you know, basically we, we would, we were getting together and we would have a picnic and, you know, for the children at school, et cetera. And one of the questions that I always had for these people, I always wanted to know, man, how, how did you get, how did you get to this place? How did you, the question I had was, how did you figure out you were being lied to? And I think, I think that's what we mean. And, and I don't know if we need to provide more context uh, or who the audience is going to be, but I think the assumption that we're both working here, you and I, is that, um, you know, we, we're being lied to and it's important to use, uh, uh, parse the information that's coming in and not just taking in passively, you know, just accepting everything that come, we come across, which I think is the mode that I was in, and maybe most of us were in as you a know. result of our schooling. <laughs> yeah, our schooling, our upbringing, society, conventions, just told not, and taught not to question things. And then once you recognize or start to get an inkling that you're being lied to, then what, right? Like what happens after that? Right? Yeah. So um, so anyway, so we're at this point where we're, I guess we're a group of people that, that have this in common. We don't buy the official narrative around what's happening with, you know, government response or how they're, they're dealing with this pandemic, say. Um, so we disagree. And I was curious. So I would ask him, how did you first realize you were, I, I would, that's how, in fact, I, I became known for that, introducing myself that way. <laughs> My name's Luis. How are you? Welcome. Nice. I would bring coffee, right? I wanted people to feel welcome. I thought, what can I do? So I would bring coffee. I would make coffee there. I bring my stove and whatever. And like, how do you do? My name's Luis. How did you realize you were being lied to? Um, Cause it seemed like an important question. I, I was, I wanted to know. And then I've been thinking about this for, I don't know how long now years. How do, um, how do I shake people awake? And tell them, hey, psh, you know, we're, we're put your radar up and 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 start filtering this information. Don't just passively accept it. What I heard from this group varied. Um, a lot of people got there through intuition and uh, a feeling, right? Like something felt wrong. Um, a lot of these people are, I don't know what the word is, witchy. Um, they're they're, uh oh. I'm on the phone. What's up? Thank you, Who's upstairs? Can you close the door? Thank you. So right. they're, that's all right. So they're, they're intuitives. They're intuitive. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm not in a way that I'm not at all. I've never really had any, any kind of out of body experience or a religious experience like that. So I was really curious. Um, you know, they would say stuff like, um, well, some of them were kind of, I think I described one person I'm thinking of as a little witchy. So I was, I was really taken with them, right? From my point of view, they figured something out using something that I don't understand. Maybe there's something to this. Maybe they, they really do talk to their ancestors, or maybe they really are channeling a spirit, or maybe they really are, they have a, some kind of clairvoyance. So, so, so the people in your group, they were intuitive and that didn't, make too much sense to you. Mm -hmm. um, so how were they able to explain that or or what else did they come up with? 
Well, um, they didn't. That's the thing. I guess the explanation was very, very satisfying to me, and it was very, it was just very mysterious. So I, I, I took them for their word, right? I mean, maybe they really do talk to ancestors. Maybe they really do. Maybe they are witchy. Maybe they really are supernatural, right? In some sense. So I was really open to that. I think I've always been very open to that. But but this seemed like proof, right? So I'm standing in front of these people and they have these things. And I, I think I uh, it became a gradual dissolutionment for me anyway, because I, uh, there were other things that it felt like they're, their methods had led them astray, let's say. So they were, I think they were right in avoiding... Um, and, and not buying into the fear narrative that, you know, those are the past couple of years. So, you know, in that sense, yeah, we were get, getting together and there were kind of a community that I found. So in that sense, I was very grateful. Uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, there were, there were other things that it's like, oh, this isn't quite right. You know, this, this, this aspect of your life seems to be kind of, well, their life was a mess in some cases, like you don't know how to manage your life. Uh, so your methods are failing you here. Like that's, you know, I, I see problems in how you're raising your children. I see problems, you know, so I would, I don't know, I, I think in some ways it left me um, more appreciative of, of, and it could look, it could be my bias. I'm an engineer, I'm, I'm kind of even just a logical person. I don't, I, I lack that spiritual muscle. And this is how I would describe it to them, right? I, I, I'm really trying to understand. And I would tell them, I've never, I've never experienced anything like this. I think I lack in the spiritual muscle. You know, I'm just maybe tone deaf. I'm not, I'm not picking up these things. Um, so they were able to kind of get too into it that things were wrong or things weren't quite right, or maybe they were being lied to, Yeah. but they have some other, um, maybe they were intuiting or not doing other things in their life that could lead them to more healthy, happy, or successful living conditions. That's right. And so coming from the other side, from the, from the left brain engineering side, how did you figure out that something was off? <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny, right? I, I, yeah, for I, no intuition here, man. I was as, let's say, blue pilled as they come. I believed everything I taught. I, I was very obedient all through school. Um, I, <laughs> you know, school, I think, selects for obedience. That was me. And when you first asked me this, I've been, believe it or not, the entire day I've been thinking about, about this. Every time somebody asked me, so I would ask people, how did you figure you, you were being lied to? They would ask me my wife standing by and I would almost always answer something different. Something else would come to mind. It's like, Oh, there was this moment and there was this moment and there was this moment. And then finally she's, she's kind of helped me cobble it together, but it started general, general terms. The, the very first time I remember was I was getting fat. This is before kids. I wanted to lose weight. Cause I was like, Oh man, I'm getting chunky. And I just started looking into nutrition and what advice there is around losing weight. And it was all incoherent. And it's like, how can there be so much confusion about what a proper human diet is? You know, and I started diving into that. And one of the things I started realizing was that nutrition science is um, wrought with uh, confusion and, and maybe a lot of corruption. And there's a lot of bad advice that seems um, uh, deliberate, deliberately malicious. So, for instance, you know, a lot of the claims around um, and this is what comes to mind for whatever reason, you know, about meat causing either cancer or heart disease. I forget what it was. Like you think, oh, that's, that's pretty bad. Uh, but then you look at the basis for this and it's like, oh, they were feeding rabbits meat, but rabbits don't eat meat. So anyway, so they, they feed rabbits meat, they get sick. And then on the basis of this, they make this claim. It's like, oh, wow. So let me start parsing this. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking at, so that was part of it, right? I just, I started asking questions. Why is nutrition science so wrought with these terrible conclusions, right? When you, when you look at the source, it makes no sense. So the, some, something wasn't working for you and you started to investigate and you started to learn more, like looking under the covers and behind the curtain and understanding that maybe that was that way for a reason. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, and that of course took a while. It's like, why yeah. is this so difficult? They can't decide whether cholesterol is good or bad for you. Remember there was the, there was a, I think a Time Life magazine cover it was kind of famous where they showed an egg being released from prison in the front cover because the eggs didn't cause heart disease or I forget what it was, but um, yeah. So this back and forth. So why is that so confusing? And that many years later, I really, it took a lot of, it took a long time for me. And I just reading stuff, reading stuff. Um, 
and then actually started, that's when I started really looking into PubMed, which is an amazing treasure trove, right? So you can actually, a lot of the time, see the actual science experiments that were done to reach the conclusions. And it's amazing how many times, even in PubMed, if you actually take the time to read it, the heading doesn't match, you know, what, the, you know, they're right. And it, it leads to this conclusion over here, but then the headline says this. And if you're just reading headlines, um, it's like, why is this so broken, right? Um, so then the understanding of the corruption came later. So that was part of it. I, it started with, with kind of health and nutrition. Then the other moment for me that, that kind of woke me up was financial, believe it or not. So um, I came across Max Kaiser. I don't know if you've heard this guy. He's kind of crazy. He's, he's, um, but it was a speech that he gave in London regarding um, what's it called? Gordon's Bottom where uh, England famously or infamously sold the bulk of its gold reserves at rock bottom prices. Yes. So fascinating stuff. But that I think that was the first time I remember thinking the world doesn't work the way I've been told. Because and, and I've, I, I fact checked this. I, it's a fascinating story. But the upshot is it seems like the the leadership of England sacrificed national sovereignty to protect New York bankers. So um, <laughs> that's, that's surprising, right? So now the, the governmental leadership of England doesn't seem to care about its people. It's more interest. It's either being controlled by or more interested in the well-being of a New York banker. So, you know, you, you said this is surprising, right? What I'm saying might be surprising to people. Um, the, the name of the video is uh, Max Kaiser does Westminster. If you want to look it up, it's probably okay. still there. No, oh, that's great. And so Gordon... <clears throat> I forget what Gordon's last name was or first name. And he was the prime minister at the time, right? And, and then he sold some large portion of England's gold at the bottom of the market. Yeah, and the way he went about it. So apparently Max Kaiser was somewhat involved in either the planning of this. So there's certain things that you do not do when you're going to sell a massive amount of gold. And uh, he outlines them. I forget what they are. Like you don't have an auction. You don't announce ahead of time that you're going to sell this gold, because you, uh, because then people who manipulate the market will drive down the price, expecting this large sell-off. So he did everything he was told not to do. Mm -hmm. He was warned, if you do this, you're going to drive the price of gold down. He did it anyway. Later on, they found out. So he, they, I, I guess the way he tells it, he's scratching his head. Why is he doing this? We told him not to do it. And it had catastrophic consequences for England or the people of England or, the, you know, um, later on, they find out that this New York bank had made really bad bets on gold. And if the if if the prices of gold weren't driven down drastically through some action, they would have failed. So in, in the light of that, then the, the actions of Gordon and I don't remember if he was a minister of finance, he was some high ranking guy. So I'm vetting this. Tim, I didn't even know that countries actually had gold hoards. You know, I, I'd heard of Fort Knox, obviously, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really understand. So that was that was the beginning of doing grammar. See, you know, we like to talk about the trivium, uh, learning a, about how global finance works a little bit. So anyway, but I was just vetting this. Is this true? Who is this guy? Right. He's just he's just telling me a story. But if it's true, the implications are profound. The world doesn't work the way, you know, bankers seem to. Uh, sit above government leaders. So there was the idea of democracy, right? And and who's really in charge and who's really looking out for our interests. So that was so, another piece. So they're in transnational. They have no like loyalty to their own country and they sit above the government of those countries. Right. Yeah. So that was kind of early on. So that was another important piece kind of stuck in my mind, you know, like a splinter, like this is, there's something I, I need to start paying attention. Um, so that kind of, so the, the food and then the finances kind of cracked the door and, <laughs> yeah. and, and then did you kind of move on to other subjects or were there other events or incidents that held your interest and had you researching that led to new insight? Um, I think what happened was just realizing that I was being lied to about the nature of say society meant that I was asking questions and kind of my radar went up and everything else later came very quickly. So I think like 9-11 happened and there were a lot of open questions around 9-11, things that didn't make sense, that still don't make sense. 
contradictions. I didn't think I know I knew that term. Well, I knew the term, but I hadn't really looked into logic or the trivium, I think, before that. I came across Rich's work looking into 9-11. Um, so that was that was also a big, big shocker, I suppose. Right. It's like, okay, we're being lied to. And and it was um and it was retroactive actually. When it first happened, I believed everything I was told. But um it was engineers and architects for 911 Truth. I forget exactly what that group is called, but they're credible and they brought out questions that I never I've never seen answered, right? In a satisfying way. So there's unanswered questions there. Um, and you know, I, I remember the consolidation of media. That seems suspicious. Like, why is the media? Why are they the media in the English-speaking world? Why, why are we allowing it to be consolidated? That doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, and I think maybe the other profound. So yeah, it was a bunch of things. I just started asking questions. So 9/11 was a problem. Then John Rappaport uh, played a big part for me as well. Um, and I started finding, I think, investigative journalists that I whose work I would follow and then vet. And the vetting was not necessarily because I don't trust them, but it was just another way of learning more about, I don't know, human immunology. How, how does the human immune system work? It's fascinating stuff like that, or how are vaccines made, or, um, you know, what's the nature of corruption? What, what <laughs> you know, where, where does Western medicine come from? Um, you know, what are the underlying beliefs in Western medicine, and and are they valid? Right, um, things that I never would have thought to, to question before. So. Um, so in some ways, yeah, I ended up, um, with some, some non mainstream views on most things. Uh, in fact, it was a staycation. Uh, there was alcohol involved. Ronnie remembers this. I, I, <laughs> at some point I, you know, it was a late night, there was booze and there were already, I had these problems in my head. It's like, okay, there's corruption. Here. There seems to be some corruption here and a little bit of corruption here. And, you know, they're, they're kind of lying about that too. But at some point I got up from my computer and I told Ronnie, my wife, everything's a lie, you know? And I think that's, that was the watershed moment. So these things led to me realizing that almost everything I understood about the nature of the reality that I live in was suspect. And I started questioning every assumption I've had. And I think I've, I'm still in that mode. <laughs> it's been fascinating. I've met some cool people. So you, start, you started like <laughs> asking questions and you got some relevant answers and they'd led to places where you didn't know that they would go or that you'd never been told before. Oh. You didn't experience in your regular consumption of media or in school or in teaching. There were some, some doors yeah. that people told you to stay away from. You started to open some of these things and you kind of had a, had an, like a real slap in the face awakening at some point <laughs> with alcohol involved. <laughs> you said, alcohol. everything is a lie. <laughs> You know, and maybe the alcohol helped in that. I think, I don't know. I I think some people, well, they say that it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. So maybe the alcohol helped with the blow to the ego, realizing that I was wrong about everything. But yeah, so, I think that's a summary. So when was that? Like how many years ago? It's been a long time. It was before kids. So uh, I want to say that might have been... Yeah, that might have been, well, yeah, let's say eight, 10 years ago. Eight, 10 I'm not sure about the, uh, about the timeline, but it's been a process. All right, so I realized that everything was suspect, that there are people whose interests are served by lying and that the information that we're consuming is controlled. It's not this free market of ideas that I think, well, that's what they use. That's the phrase they use. And I, that's the idea that I had. But there's, there's social engineering, realizing that there's we're awash in social engineering. That's the conclusion that it led that it led to. I think that's the watershed. And now I need to start mapping out my reality. So I, I, I like that as a like a starting point as we're awash in social engineering. Yeah. Like what are some of the evidence of that or sources of it that you see as affecting us on a on a daily basis? I'll tell you a lot of things that I was curious about. Uh, since I was a kid that I was able to find answers as a man in my 40s. One, why are British so good at pop, right? Like I used to wonder, like, man, it's like this, the, these rock invasions, right? It's like oh, the rock and roll and the Beatles. And, you know, it was like, and waves. It wasn't just in the 60s. It was waves that came later. It's like, why are British people uniquely good at, at pop music? Well, you realize that's part of control of culture. 
And that's, that's one of the control centers of the English speaking world is England. So they were exporting this culture as a way of controlling society. And when I first came across this idea, it seemed a little bit hyperbolic, right? It's just music. But there's two things that were pointed out to me that, that made sense. One was the radical transformation of America during that time. So we went from Leave it to Beaver to micro mini skirts and, and free love, right? In a, in a span of 10 years. So you and, went from the Beatles White Album to Sgt. Pepper. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it's, and, and it's with funny. Aleister Crowley on the cover, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, man. And I, I had no idea about any of that at that point. But it was like, it was curious, right? Cultures normally are stable throughout hundreds of years. And they had this radical transformation. Um, apparently using music was a big part of that, right? The, the 60s counter counterculture that, okay, so, but okay, so, but maybe that's something that happened um, organically. There's a couple of really good books. Uh, I have them back there. I don't, I, I can't recall the titles right now. Weird scenes uh, from the canyon, maybe? Yeah, there you go. That's right. Yeah. So all, all the connections to all these pop, first of all, pop stars out of nowhere, right? Like never picked up a guitar, but somehow is in a band selling albums and on a cover a year later and connections. I mean, every band you've ever heard of direct connections to military intelligence seems like more than a coincidence with the exception of Pink Floyd. I, th I think they might be clean. So I I'm holding out hope because <laughs> they've ruined every other band for me. You know, I, I changed the radio now. It's like, I, uh, and, but the, the way this works, Tim, I, I think it's fascinating. There's a documentary called uh, searching for sugar man. And it's about a rock and roll uh, artist, an American you've never heard of, okay? But somebody smuggled his records into South Africa. And it's actually pretty good music. Uh, the guy, nothing happened to him here. You never heard of him. He never sold any records, but he, became, he was bigger than Elvis. He was bigger than the Beatles in South Africa. The music was really good, right? So they're interviewing uh, these, well, they're, they're now old guys but they were young when they started protesting and, and you know, bringing down this system of apartheid. And apparently to a man, all these rebels credit this man's music as the spark that started a revolution that brought down a country. It's a fascinating documentary. I totally recommend it, right? Um, so it, to me in my mind, so like, yeah, that's the power. Of, that's what you want to control music. That's why you need to control pop, right? I mean, it, it's the power of an idea. So this guy had some revolutionary ideas. And, you know, you listen to the song and, and a lot of it just talks about the establishment being corrupt and, you know, but th their kids and, and their media was so controlled because they lived in a totalitarian state that was South Africa that they had just never been exposed to anything. And then somebody smuggles in this album, becomes bigger than Elvis, bigger than the Beatles. Everybody, like an entire generation of South Africa grew up listening to this, to this man's records. And um, it led to a revolution, a country falls, right? Well, maybe that's why music is so controlled here because, you know, that's the power of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, you know, if they can take the Beatles from the White Album to Sgt. Pepper, they can take Hannah Montana <laughs> to Miley Cyrus. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. The the cultural capture and trans transmission or translation or transmogrification <laughs> of the of the people and they drag all of the, the fans along with them. And I guess you know it didn't make sense to me either when I was growing up that the music changed like every five or ten years. Yeah. And what was wrong with the old music? Well, I don't know. Uh, but every opportunity you had to listen to music was going to be different in the next two or three or four or five years. And there was some wave or movement that they supported for some reason. And I know that the Congress for Cultural Freedom was a operation to broadcast Amer American culture across the world <clears throat> and to kind of denigrate other cultures. But I mean, that's just one of the strange things when you start to peel back the onion that doesn't make any sense unless there's a plan of some sort, yeah. unless it was organized. Right. Um, yeah. So, and then I started playing with it, it, right. So, I mean, so I think what they're doing is they're planting ideas in our heads that, you know, collectively, you know, they, they're kind of 
they're they're steering us right they they, 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 they it's control i mean i didn't know what the purpose was you know maybe it's just that financial corruption or you know financial gain but then i started thinking i wonder how many ideas that i have in my head are actually mine um for instance one of the big ones was kids right everybody of my generation i'm in the bay area so that's probably part of it but almost all my friends single no kids right whereas my parents generation you know by the time they were in their mid-20s they were married and with kids yeah it was in another country but you know it's something that people did and I, I, I remember having conversations with my friends, like, so where did everybody get the idea to just stop having kids? Like, where, where did this come from, right? Um, and anyway, so yeah, so stuff like that, I, I think is, is, is suspicious that we all collectively meet a left turn, you know, as if though we're being, you know, some, there's an orchestrator or, or, you know, somebody directing. So all of a sudden everybody, you know, no kids and, and, you know, birth rates are falling throughout the West and that seems to be pretty universal especially having experienced having two kids and the joy of being a, a father um, and, and the love, you know, my, my only regret is that I didn't start sooner so I could have more, right? I understand why people have 10 kids. I get it, you know? So anyway, so that, that, was, that was another, the social engineering, finding out that social engineering, I think that was a big part of it. So and th those are, I think of my two best uh, bits of evidence, you know? Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah pop music in, that com in that com documentary yeah yeah pop music why why aren't people having children and <clears throat> how do those thoughts get into our head what is it that causes us to think in that way and i, I in one part of our Richard Grove's work is working with John Taylor Gatto. And that's how I found him really was that initial interview that he did with Gatto that made so much sense to me. And it was, it was like, um, you know, I had been questioning for years and looking for sources and looking for better information, looking for quality, looking for things that were not lies. And something about that interview just opened up a whole new world of investigation. And I felt like, they were saying the things that I intuitively knew, but didn't have the avenue for or the answer to go to go find. And here was a guy telling us, well, here's how and here's why and here's when and here's all the information here. You can read these books and and here's all the historical events that led to these things. It was really fascinating to kind of. I, I don't know, it was like a slingshot like a knowledge slingshot. <laughs> yeah, but it but it rings true, right? And I've had that experience also, where maybe something just didn't make sense. And then something comes forward some a bit of evidence. And maybe even before you vet it, it just you recognize that, you know, the, the truth in that. So john Taylor's work, I think I reflected on my own experience through school. And it, it was true. It was amazing how many things I learned on my own during the summers when they would just leave me alone. You know, I experienced some boredom. I had access to a library. I had access to a friend's computer. And um, yeah, I, some really profound things that affected me. I can't think of too many things that happened during school where, you know, some profound learning or anything that happened to me that was meaningful. Um, and it was always in the summers that, that I can point to. So when I heard him describe, you know, the difference between schooling and education, it's like, oh, I get it. Um, you know what, you know, that makes it makes very little sense that people learn by being lectured at, right? Just sitting there passively being, being talked to. Schooling is for fish. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Education is for men and women. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think everything else came out of rise. You're right. John Taylor Gatto. I, I'm trying to think if I, I'm, I think it was the same for me, Tim. I think I found John Taylor Gatto and then I found Richard because of, I was looking for more John Taylor Gatto. I, I, I think that's how it went. And then there's that five hour, you know, interview that was yeah the five hour interview and then the 15 hours of decomposition of the interview afterwards <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i've gone through that actually it was it was really really good so it was brett and richard and um well i think richard was on there but certainly brett and then i think jan irvin was on there too okay yeah and that's another guy um the trivium 
And I think John Irving gets some, a lot of credit for that, right? His interview with Gino Denning. Yes. No, that was really, really good. And I, I think, you know, we have these moments where we go for years and maybe we have these suspicions and then a door opens and we choose whether to walk through it or not. Most people choose not to. And if you walk through the door, then your world is inevitably and forever changed because you can't unsee what you see. Yeah. And I, I feel like the acceleration of those moments and opportunities is increasing, right? Those moments and things are increasing for me. Yeah. They're happening more often. And yeah. it, I don't know if it makes life more interesting, yeah. more frightening, or or makes us more of a pariah to people that we interact with on a daily basis, because I find myself having to just nod and smile um, with different people. And, and, you know, maybe ask some questions, but it, it's hard because, like you said, it's easier to convince people uh, to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled because their their ego is tied up in the I'm not going to be fooled by anybody because I'm too smart for that, right? Well, <clears throat> if you take that idea that I know nothing, so so tell me, teach me, and I might have something to learn from you. And okay, I'm going to be wrong sometimes, but uh, we have a way or a method of of ferreting out the the truth, and it's not something to be afraid of. Then there's just so much more you can can learn. Yeah. That was a big part of it. And I guess you're, you're, well, I, th I think what we came across or what I think what you're describing is kind of like the trivium, right? We, we t there's been a lot of talk about it. And for me, it was just this idea, right? There's this ancient method to tell truth from non-truth that I had never heard of, right? What is this thing? How come I have, it sounds important. It sounds useful, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's, I, I, how come I haven't come across this before and trying to find sources in English was difficult, right? There's just not a lot that's out there that's been written about this thing that seems really important. Um, and then, uh, you know, wondering what it was, where can I learn it? And then, and then, you know what I found? Probably the trickiest is how to integrate it. So it's one thing to, to read it. And then the other thing is to, so anyways, so just finding out that there was such a thing as a trivium, uh, but I hadn't been told. So, th so that method of, determining what's real and what's not real and why was that method not taught to us at some early age yeah. it's almost like okay there's there's common sense which i would consider intuition of the truth yeah. and then there's a, a method yeah. of determining it um, yeah. through investigation and common sense is not common <laughs> and the method is hidden. So that leaves us with kind of like fishing around in the dark or, or accepting what we're told. Yeah. You know, it's funny. There's, I think there's a philosophical divide where I, between where I am now and where I was before. Um, and one of them, it started when I started, well, okay. So the, the, the trivium is grammar, logic, rhetoric. And when, when I, okay, I want to learn this, I, I'm not sure how to study rhetoric, or I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to study grammar, but I, lo logic and, and, and rhetoric, okay. I'll, I'll join a Toastmasters so I can help improve how I speak. But then logic, let me start reading logic. And it was in the early, I, I think it was a Peacock lectures, Introduction to Logic. Yeah. The very first 30 minutes, I think I've listened to 20 times now, maybe the first hour, like that introduction. It's one of the profound ideas, or one of the most profound ideas baked into logic and Arist Aristotle, or logic in general, I guess, is that reality exists outside of our mind and our wishes and our thoughts and feelings that truth is, is universal and it, it is what it is, right? On the other side, there's solipsism. And, you know, this idea that the reality is a figment of our imagination or that we can alter it just by thinking about it without taking action. Um, so that was profound, right? Because if you accept that, then... And it, and it was one of those moments, Tim, I think that's, sorry, I think that's why I got on a long tangent here. When, like when you said you just recognize truth or, you know, something resonates. 
when I came across, I never thought about it. I never thought of a solipsism. I never thought about, you know, I, I mean, Mark Pascoe talks about it, but I think it hurt, hit me harder listening to uh, the Peacock lectures. Um, it's like, yeah, I, I mean, I have no proof. I have no proof that the whole universe isn't a figment of my imagination, really. But it seems silly to assume, you know, to not assume the truth exists independently of, of my mind. So my task is to try to map out reality uh, and to build my mental model of how the world works, right? So I can avoid pitfalls and walking into walls and stuff. And that tool is logic, right? So the other important thing is that that I walk away from that early introduction. It's like things have to make sense. We are capable of making sense of the world, all of us. And if there's a contradiction, then that means that there's a mistake or a lie. It's unsettled, right? It's an open question. If your conclusions are based on a contradiction, you know, watch out. <laughs> so we can determine reality and contradictions tell you that there's something wrong, that there's a mistake or a lie. Now, what room in there is there for emotions and intuition? Well, that not everything can be broken down to logic. I was thinking about this, right? So like deciding certain decisions, I think are just, you know, it's just logic, but I don't know, deciding who to marry, right? That's not a logical decision. I don't, I don't know how you can use the rules of logic, you know? Well, some people have a checklist, right? <laughs> there is that, right? Yo, absolutely. That, no, that's, that's right. That's true. I, I definitely had a checklist. But that's kind checklist. of like nail, nailing jello to the wall, right? Because it changes yeah. <laughs> over time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I, I, um, but you know, I think it's Mark Passio again, you know, I, I was a profound idea in one of his and I know I heard it from him. Um, they 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 work together, but it's it's thoughts first. So it's as you think, so you feel, and so you act. And you have to put all all those three in alignment: your thoughts, your emotions, and your and your actions. And emotions, I think, like our internal moral compass. I think we have something like that. I don't know if that falls in, into emotions or intuition. Um, you know, there's there's some things baked into our psyche that are not logical, but but are po profound, and I think are also a, a compass for for us as we go through life. But you, but and I've thought about this a lot, right? Which goes first? Is it, it thought thoughts first or emotions first? And I think it's clearly the way Mark Passio put it. It is it is you, you can't know what to feel until you know what to think. Uh, generally speaking, right? So I'm thinking of, you know, you see a man beating a dog and you feel bad for the dog, but then you learn that the dog is rabbit and just mauled a baby and is threatening another child. And then you might jump in and help beat the dog, right? I mean, it, it, so I guess that's how I would categorize it. Um, but there's things that logic can't help you with. Yeah, that, no, that's interesting. I mean, what I've run across too is that <clears throat> the, you know, we have, we have tripwires and triggers in our brain and in our nervous system. And whenever we're reminded of that, sometimes we go right to action instead of thinking. Mm. And inevitably that leads to, um, mm -hmm. to something that might not be in our best interest or, or the best interest, uh, interest of others. So being able to, in the moment, have a thought about the feeling that comes up and then make a choice as to what action you're going to take. And I think that's really difficult and, and it can be learned. And maybe there's some situations for all of us where we just go right to the trigger unless we specifically focus on that thing. But I also think that that's where media and the, the social control comes in because they trigger people's emotions to elicit an action that they desire, right? That that the social controllers desire. So they trigger the emotions to elicit the action. And that's where the thinking comes in. If you want to, you know, do things that are in your own best interest, do things that are in the best interest of people that you care about, or recognize that you're being lied to. Yeah. And that, that I personally hate to be lied to. 
And <laughs> so, so that's why we're in this discussion and we're in this arena to ferret out truth from lies. And then to try to have the the best or biggest positive impact on the people that we care about for ourselves and for others in general, you know, basically the, how do we avoid acting from those feelings of the social engineers? Yeah, that's right. And it's funny, I think part of it is, um, I don't know, I have a story, right? When I started looking at uh, logical fallacies. I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, you know, and you start going through them, you learn the names and you start recognizing. And what's interesting too is, you know, Aristotle says, this is a logical fallacy. You think, well, and you look at it, you think, oh yeah, that, okay. I, I can, yeah, that this is clearly <laughs> true, right? That this is a mistake. So you go through it. So that's what, that was my experience looking at the logical fallacies. I'll, I'll buy off on these. They make sense. They're just, I get it. I was, I was in my car listening to a podcast of Bill Maher, who I used to listen to. This is a long time ago. <laughs> um, and he ha- they were discussing something. And there was a panel of people. And uh, it was, I think, the state of Venezuela. I don't remember what. But one of the guys on the panel, it was just uh, nothing but logical fallacy after logical fallacy after logical fallacy, well-dressed. I think I wouldn't have recognized it prior to learning some basic logical fallacies, but I'm sitting there and I'm just rattling these things off in my head. It's like, wait, that's appeal to emotion. That's a non sequitur. It's, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm just going through it. And, um, but it got to the point where I'm like, this guy's doing it deliberately. Right. You, you, and I, I was so I, <laughs> talking about controlling your emotions. I'm sitting there, I'm pissed off and I'm, I'm, I'm shouting and cussing out the radio. Right. <laughs> like, uh, and I was stuck in traffic and it's, you know, and maybe it's just a tense moment anyway. I'm like, oh, you know, and Bill Maher and whatever. And just, and it's funny because the woman, there was a young woman in front of me in her car. She starts brake checking me for whatever reason. She assumed that my anger was directed at her for oh. whatever reason. Right. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there going, I mean, you know, at that point that, you know, I just immediately calmed down. It's like, this is silly. I'm having a child with that <laughs> first, right. In my car. And then now she's upset at me because she thinks for whatever reason, so the whole way she's she's kind of like trying to get me to rear end her, I guess, to get might get me in trouble. Um, but and, and I deleted that podcast and I didn't listen to Bill Maher for a while, ever again. I think after that, I, I you know, I don't know that he had anything to do with it necessarily. It was a panelist. So you're, so that's an example of learning and then understanding rhetorical tricks, yeah. logical fallacies, and then applying that in the real world, and then having your eyes open to wait a minute here. Uh, this might not be in my best interest to believe all these things, yeah. to take them at face value. Yeah, right. I'm being lied to. And that's not a good argument why, you know, communism is a good idea, you know, <laughs> or whatever the guy was arguing about, you know. Well, that would be kind of fun to like watch the evening news and just pick out all the logical fallacies that they come up with. You know, I think John Irving did something like that, right? The uh, pop up logical fallacies. Yeah, pop up fallacies. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it was a short clip and it's kind of amazing. That's all these guys do. It's nothing but logical fallacies. But, you know, the yeah, that was, I, I guess it was a profound moment. It's like, oh, this stuff is having an impact. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's th- think about that from a media source and from a perspective of, okay, well, what the hell can you listen to that, that is meaningful and has value and... And how do we spend our time, mm. our limited time that we have? Yeah. And what should we be avoiding? Um, and I, I've been putting more thought into that because of the, okay, I don't watch TV much, and but I spend a lot of time on my phone, and I spend a lot of time with autonomy people or, or people who think like I do for the most mm. part. And so I'm not necessarily, I feel like I'm bathed in major media, like wherever I go, it's, I can't even avoid it because the screens are on, right? They're on. I walk into work and the screens are on, the screens are at work and they're all saying messages and it's very subliminal because there's no sound, but you just read the headline in it and it brings up an emotion, right? It's yeah. enough. One One time I actually sat for like an hour and a half and I just wrote all the CNN bylines down that came up, right? Uh, and it was 
very informative as to what they were trying to make you think. So there's no sound. There were just the words, but there was there was a clear direction within all the words that were coming up. Um, so where do you get your information now, knowing all these things? Okay, so it's interesting where uh, that's an interesting. Yes, that's a good point. I think uh, that the phrase that um, and I'm borrowing this from somebody then come up with this weaponized anthropology is how you would describe it right everywhere we go it's it's been weaponized um so yeah mass media is designed not to make you smarter but make, you know confuse you make you dumb so i i like you i'm no fun at work because i stopped watching pretty much watch stopped watching tv I, I stopped watching sports i stopped watching well not that i ever was much into sports but i definitely had you know no time for that anymore um it, pop uh, music I, I don't even run the radio uh, so I became interested in folk art, folk, actual culture, you know, and folk music. So, you know, when we'd go to the farmer's market and there's some guy with his guitar selling a CD of his own music, that's what I would buy and put in the car for the kids to listen to, for us to listen to. That's also been gratifying, actually. I've, I've discovered stuff that, anyway, you know, folk music from around the world or even uh, even from Mexico, right? It's denigrated. You know, I, I grew up in the city, so city folks don't listen to, you know, country bumpkin kind of uh, music, but some of it is, is actually quite, I, some of it is actually just beautiful and, and you know, but, but it's, so it's organic and it's something that came out of a culture naturally. And so that's, that's so, you know, just avoid the kind of commercial pop music. In terms of sources of information, that's a good question, Tim. I mean, so I think the first thing is even just having your radar up is probably the biggest transformative change. Not a, not passively accepting it, but just putting it through a filter. And it's like, is this true? What's the basis of this? Um, and just asking those questions, even when it's mainstream news, right? Um, but uh, I found a lot of investigative journalists independently doing work that have been excellent sources of information. So now I pretty much, you know, instead of reading the newspaper, not that I ever really, re really, yeah, that's not true, I did. I was a news junkie for a while before I w woke up or whatever. I'll read John Rappaport's uh, memo blasts. I find him to be incredibly enlightening. Um, and, and you know, he points you to the source material. It's all sourced, you know? So he'll, he'll come up with um, probably his most uh, <laughs> infamous work is AIDS Inc., where he just tracks you down and it's amazing how much how much background he has to provide so you learn about the immune system you learn about uh some of these medicines that they give people and, and he just blasts all kind of holes in that and uh so yeah that's that's and he's very active still i don't know how old he is but he's still you know providing information and there's good people you know luke rudowski kind of gave him a breakdown on what's happening around around the world the, the news that actually matters not what's on on cnn or fox news but you know it's like oh hey they got they're openly admitting they got internment camps in Australia. They're calling quarantine camps. So man, that sure looks like an internment camp. Uh, why is that not on front page news, you know, in the mass media? Yeah, and it's it's kind of encouraging to see the numbers for mass media continually going down and down and down. And um, what was encouraging and was Joe Rogan podcast right. and, and and okay, they're getting 40, 50 million views yeah. and the mainstream media can't get a million views during prime time. Right. right. So, so maybe people are switching on there and they're switching off and not that that's the be all end all of information, but it's a, maybe a good starting point that message that people are not going to gulp down this just pure propaganda. Um, they're not going to pay for it. They're not going to pay for it with their time, their attention, or their dollars. Right. You know, and it's not even about Joe Rogan. He has some pretty credible guests, right? Uh, Robert Malone. So this guy co-invented or is part, primarily responsible for mRNA technology. He's got some interesting things to say, and he's a credible guy, right? But we can't uh, have him on Twitter because he's telling the truth. <laughs> right. Well, and that's the thing. So who, who bans information? It's always the tyrant, right? Yes. I've become interested in North Korea. I've been binge watching videos on North Korea. It's fascinating, first of all. And, but you know, it's obvious how tightly controlled the information is. There's a, 
a whistleblower. This was a South Korean woman that went to teach work in a school in North Korea. And uh, she couldn't uh, she couldn't talk about the outside world. There were all these rules and stipulations and all her interactions with the students were monitored. But she was saying how the students you know, would they would talk about they would dream about visiting Czechoslovakia and, you know, places that no longer existed. I mean, that's how controlled their information is, right? They they're told that Americans are starving and eat out, you know, eat out of the garbage when that actually probably more describes North Korea, right? Um, so yeah, this total this total this total control of information. And it occurred to me that that's kind of what they're doing globally with this propaganda and this weaponized anthropology, say, right? They they're it's like maybe that's the first fence they have to put up is the intellectual one, right? Where they control what information you have access to. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't, for some reason, like the Macy conferences, and when you mentioned weaponized anthropology, I'm thinking about Gregory Bateson and Obama's mother, Stanley and Dunham, <laughs> and that how they, based, and, and Lolo Sotero, you know, how they, during World War II, studied the indigenous peoples of the South Pacific in order to control them in the war effort and, and how you know, Nazi scientists experimented on people in the concentration camps in order to understand drugs and human nature and, and how all that was weaponized from a commercial standpoint and that the, um, you know, the OSS had used and Edward Bernays and all those guys had used propaganda to get people fired up about the war and to, then they brought that information back and they just turned it on the American people through commercial advertising. And then once the propaganda, um, I mean, there was always propagandizing, but then Obama got that law overturned. I have to remember what that was, that they couldn't propagandize people in the United States, right? So now what are we seeing? We have the guy on Fox News who wears a CIA lapel pin, right? Um, <laughs> obviously, it's we're, we're in the mockingbird world. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's well, so much to say there. Um, that was another interesting data point was propaganda by Edward Bernays. So, in his own words, they're telling you he he gives you examples of the sort of trickery that they use, and what's insidious is they make it seem like it's your own idea. That's what makes it insidious. So they they present, they walk you through a actually fairly basic and simplistic conclusion. You're going to arrive. I mean, if you buy the premises that they're laying out for you, you're going to arrive at the conclusion they want you to arrive at. But they never, they never actually tell you. They let you reach that conclusion on your own. Let you think that you reach that conclusion on your own, and now you own this idea, right? So he describes this in in selling. I think they were selling pianos. So they and, and it's the same old trickery that well. That, that you start you start seeing patterns. They created a fake magazine, some architectural digest. And in one of the articles in the architectural digest that they were distributing to Americans was that it's in vogue in Europe to have a music room, mm -hmm. right? For new yeah. house design. So yeah. what Americans started doing is instead of, well, you already live in your house, you designate a room as the music room, knowing that one of the most obvious things you can put in a music room is a piano. And yeah, it was very successful. They sold more pianos. The guy sold a lot of product. Yeah. Now he does talk about, I think it's in the first page that our thoughts and beliefs are directed by people we've never met, you know, and that's the true control in a, demo, uh, in a democracy. Yes. And that's straight. I mean, I, I think that's like somewhere in the first couple of pages. Uh, so just finding out that that book exists, it's like this, this you know, tiny. Oh yeah. That, that's a good one to read. I, I just read the story of, a story of Treblinka, and I could tell that a lot of it was fiction, but also there was quite a bit of that rang true to me, and that they had, they called them the technicians, and they were the social engineers. Mm. And the idea was that they, they needed to, they were going to kill everyone in Warsaw, but in the ghetto, right? They herded everybody into the ghetto, and then they were going to gradually kill them all. But <clears throat> if the people figured this out, and they had no hope, they would rebel. And then probably there would be a big destruction of property and some some of the Germans would get killed and there would be some, some 
significant conflict. So their mandate was to liquidate the kill everybody over time without any repercussions to property or to the controllers. So mm -hmm. they, they gave them these confusing things that gave them a little bit of hope. And, and then they changed it. They kept them in this constant state of confusion. And it reminded me so much of what's going on with yeah. with Fauci and the CDC and the, yeah. you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. Wait a minute, those things don't work. You got to do this. Wait a minute, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a one shot. No, it's a triple shot. No, it's a, no, it's a one mask. It's a two. A, what, a, a, oh, I'm really confused now. What the hell am I supposed to do? Just, hit, just help me. Just right. get, I'll just take whatever you want. You know, just, just empty my, my wallet. It's all yours. Right. That, that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in today is the social engineers are picking our pockets and they're sending us off to, to our doom. Yeah. It, there's, uh, I came across a book. I'm like 20 pages in it's called state of fear and uh, it was printed in England. So, but basically what they're doing is they're, they, they're outlining the psychological tricks that they use to ter ter terrify the, the heck out of people. So uh, the basic premise is that, well, anyway, they, but one of the things they highlight is um, they compare what the, the COVID narrative has been to uh, psychological warfare used in prisoners of war. And there's 15 clear, they've been identified clearly since World War II, uh, what, what you do to destroy people psychologically or, or to get them to just submit to control. But one of them is uh, confusing and arbitrary rules. Yes. So they do, they do that with the press. So that's, and, and so it, it's fascinating. They, they map things out um, to, to our present experience, you know, and it shows how we are literally being subjected to psychological warfare. Um, and the stated purpose of the arbitrary rules is that you uh, stop trying to, since you can't figure out what you're supposed to do, you give up trying to understand it and you just give yourself over entirely to whatever instructions come next something like that um i have it here uh, like i said i haven't read much of the book but i just got to that point and um it's the biderman's chart of coercion yes so, um i'm very familiar with that actually oh interesting i had never come across this before um, so for me, it was eye opening. So they, they, I actually posted this up though, what the North Koreans do to coerce you, you know, and the Chinese mind control thing, and then what's happening in, in current time. And that's just word for word all the way down. Yeah. Um, fascinating. I'll tell you something else. When this thing first started with, uh, stay at home orders or whatever you call it, the. uh, Anyway, you know, they, they, we're, we're, we're all, we're all uh, under house arrest globally. Right. Yes. But you can still buy booze. I remember telling a friend, this sure does feel like the global communist revolution that <laughs> they've been promising, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. You're very limited in North Korea, but you can still buy booze. That's one thing you can still buy. So with the Biederman's chart of coercion, there's a book yeah. associated with that? It's called uh, A State of Fear. A State of Fear. That's the book. Okay. And I'm actually reading um, Rape of the Mind by... Was that Juiced Merlu, Dutch guy, who was um, a psychiatrist, and he was interrogated by the Nazis a few times, and um, he's going through like this. I think it's from 1956 or so when this book was published, but um, going through all of the breakdown of the prisoners, like how do you break them down? How do you get them to comply? How do you get them to agree to sign their confession and agree to their own guilt? That doesn't exist. And he mentioned Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon, which is kind of a a hallmark of how they break people down. And, a, and it's a fictional depiction of a Soviet general or something like that who they had deemed um, they wanted to get rid of him. So they had to get him to confess and to his own guilt and have a show trial, uh, much like these show trials that are going on today in the United States, um, where people are expected to confess their guilt, even though they're obviously not guilty. Um, and the political prisoners that we have 
now in the United States. It's, yeah, I mean, it's pretty disturbing. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the, the tricks that they use, the struggle sessions, right, that they had in communist countries now, um, it, it's it's kind of funny, like they've got a template and they keep using it and, you know, kind of brings me back to uh, another person that I, I would, I should mention is Mark Passio. So spent a lot of time digging through his stuff, learned a lot. Uh, so according to him, uh, these occult groups, so he calls the world an occultocracy. So, it's a, the world's run by occult groups. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, but the biggest lessons of, of in the occult, it's all human psychology, and it's ancient, right? He, according to him, it goes back to to ancient Egypt. Some of these, uh, it's almost like a religious, these occult religious sects, sects, and 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 their 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 wisdom is all around human psychology. How do you control and coerce and trick people? How do you control humanity? And okay, so there's the. There's the things that are recalled from us. They're hidden. They're generational. But a lot of the stuff is available for yeah. our review. Yeah. And then why isn't it? Why isn't any of this common knowledge and isn't taught to us on how to defend ourselves? Well, wouldn't you want your children to be able to defend themselves from these manipulations? Yeah, yeah, they've done a neat trick to us. So let's say in the West, and I don't know West, you know, there's supposed to be some constitutionally protected right to free speech in the United States. The same is true again in Mexico. I don't know about anywhere else, actually. So I think in other places, even in the English speaking world, they can just arbitrarily shut down, you know, your <laughs> delete your, 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 your website or destroy your newspaper, right? So, so they've got a problem here. And it's interesting because those the constitutions, I guess, recognize that in order to be a free people and free of coercion and, and you need to be able to have access to information. So that's that's key. So but the trick that they did here is that the information's available to us. It's not available to North Koreans, it's not available to Chinese. And heck, just with China, man, that's a quarter of all the humanity, right? Yep. So they don't have access to the information. And then, and then so much of the information since the world, the nexus of global control seems to be the Anglo-American empire, right? To use another phrase, if you don't speak English, you don't have access to the primary documents. So that also cuts out a bunch of other people who through no fault of their own, just simply cannot access this information. And then, so for us here, there's no excuse other than, well, what we, we fill, we fill our horizons with entertainment and nonsense, right? I, yes. so I, think that's, I think that's part of it. People are so distracted yeah. with the bread and circuses, right? That, it, that there's no time. And, and I think what happened with me is, I, I mean, I think if they understood really the danger that we're all in or that they are being lied to, or, you know, then they would refocus their energies. They think, you know, because we're confused about what it means to be intellectually, you know, self have intellectual self-defense. They think going to school and being getting good grades and being obedient is how you get there. Right? Doesn't that mean my degree from an Ivy League, you know, program makes me elite? Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to know everything. So I, and, but in reality, you're an elite person who can obey. Yeah. Yeah. D dude. What, what, yeah. Exactly. You know. You know. It's. It's. I don't know if you ever heard this. Um, According to Mark Passio, right, there's this Freemasonic idea of the threshing floor. You see it often in places, the black and white squares, and it's symbolic of separating the wheat from the chaff. The white squares signifying, you know, knowledge and, and the, you know, the, the wheat, and then the black squares signifying ignorance and the chaff, what you throw away. So, when, so it's interesting, the black square represents ignorance. So we all graduate our universities. It's a dunce cap that they put on our head. <laughs> we graduate. It's a dunce cap. Yeah. It's it's yeah. a cult mockery. It's amazing, right? It, um, it is a mockery. <laughs> so yeah, we graduate thinking that we are educated, but in reality, we've been indoctrinated, right? So there's that, the indoctrination. And then there's the fact that, <clears throat> okay, in spite of being censored and having major platforms under controlled, and search controlled and the uh, you know critical critical race theory being taught and leftism all, all of these things that are indoctrination versus knowledge 
there's still a lot of knowledge available to us and we can read books and we can order books still. They haven't burned all the books. And then there's other sources of information that exist in other platforms that we can then go use. And I, I think for thinking people, these platforms who censor become irrelevant because you just leave, right? <laughs> and one of the challenges for me has been Okay, where do we where do I find quality information that leads somewhere? And what is the what do I what do I focus on? Like there's so many opportunities and so much to dig around in and, and I can easily get lost, of course, uh, in my rabbit holes of information and there's so many interesting things to figure out. And yes, okay, we're shining a light and the cockroaches scurry, so we're looking at cockroaches every day. We don't <laughs> want to do that. We wanna ennoble ourselves and the world by by really improving ourselves and and improving our spirit and then putting that out into the world <clears throat> so there's a lot there there's okay how do we find quality information sources and then how do we take a direction having an intent and an intention for improving ourselves and in, mm -hmm. in our situation and 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 the and the world in the face of this organized crew that's trying to tear it all down right in front of us. Um, and, and to me, I, I really do believe it's a good and evil issue. It's a spiritual issue. Yeah. Um, and we can say that we, we, we're, we can, we're human. So we're not always going to do the right thing. We have our own biases and, and, but just being aware is enough and then taking positive action against that <laughs> and and how to impact i don't know if it's the most most people but with the highest quality how do you have the biggest impact in, in that area and i think like conversations like you and i are having go a long way towards that if we can get people just to crack the door right crack the door open I agree. I think, yes. So I know, man, I, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. If, if I can help with this endeavor in any way whatsoever, I think it's something that interests, interests me. Well, A, it's something I find enjoyable. I'm learning. And then, and B, I think it is helpful because that's what it is. It's, um, it's a change in perspective. That's how they got us here. And, and that's how we get out, right? It's a change in mindset. And I think, it starts with information. I mean, at least for me, the way I'm wired anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and recognizing that we have things in common, right. We all have similar needs and, um, um, and I guess that's how this thing works, right. It's divisive. They divide us along things that do not matter. Right. Like, on, on the smallest things <clears throat> yeah. and they divide us at the, at the lowest level, which is, divide ourselves from ourselves. You know, they right. divide you from your family, from your culture, from yourself. Okay, okay. I'll be right there, Mateo. Thank Speaking you of our family. Sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Telling you that it's dinner time. It's okay. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Tim. I, I apologize. No, I mean, they, no, no, you're good. They, they divide us and they're trying to divide us from ourselves. So how do we kind of unify that? And then, you know, I have people coming and asking questions and they're like, how do I, how do I convince people? And it's like, well, you know, you don't, you can't change anybody's mind and you can't convince people. Really the only thing you can do is be caring and be the best that you can be and then have them be interested in, oh, how come this person doesn't seem to be upset about these things? Or how come they're, they're thinking about this thing differently? Like they, they become curious about um confidence or uh, the way that you carry yourself or the way you act in the world and people start to become curious and then they start to become attracted to that and then there's a little open window where you can have a conversation but it starts with like building the connection and then knowing yourself and knowing having having the knowledge and knowing and being confident and then not being triggered or upset by whatever's going on. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's something I need to work on myself. You know, I, I, I wish I could be totally detached, and, <laughs> but I can't, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, and, and Tim, I, I, 
I ask myself often, like, is this the best use of my time? Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to figure that out also. No, so we we reading... all get triggered, right? So, yeah. That, that's right. <laughs> so <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying to read. I've, I've gotten into stoicism, right? It's, it's kind of practical philosophy. So you're reading so, Epictetus? Epictetus and then um, Marcus Aurelius, his meditations. Yeah. They're both in pretty good. I've got actually a couple of them. So Epictetus, men are disturbed not by things, but by the views they take on them. Yes. Right. So, and, and I used Marcus to have, carry that book around the Anchoridian, right? When I was in college, I carried that book around. You know, that's uh, awesome. I, yeah. I just came across this recently. So actually my dad gave me a book on Epictetus as a Christmas present a few years ago. That was my introduction. I was like, okay, you know, I don't, I didn't really have any idea and I haven't read much philosophy, honestly. But so I, I came across it only recently. Well, that and Marcus Aurelius, they really make sense. Um, but I, I know that I can be triggered because we were we were in Colorado, which is not a free state. And we went, despite the signs, we went in and had our dinner without our mask on, right? People are coming in to the bar with their mask on, sitting down at the bar, taking their mask off and having their drinks and, and dinner and then putting them on and going back out, right? So we walked out and there's family that came in. My wife said they're from Florida they, and they had masks in hand and they saw us and they're like, no mess in there right and and i said well, there's a few zombies in there but fuck them right <laughs> like, like wait a minute did i just say that <laughs> and they they laughed luckily but i was like okay i i, I got triggered <laughs> well but you know what i don't know that's that's that seems like righteous indignation man that's how i would categorize it <laughs> Well, the feeling came up and the action came out and there wasn't enough thinking in between. Let's put, put it that way. But I mean, I don't know. Was it really a rash decision? If that's if that's the worst, is that, if that's one of a, a rash decision of yours that or a rash action that comes to mind, <laughs> you're doing pretty well, man. <laughs> so I had the same experience at the airport, right? When um, So I, I'm walking through the detector and uh, the guy's like, well, what's in your pocket? And I'm like, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> right? And he got all upset. And I'm like, you know, you have, you're the one with the fucking metal detector. So you tell me, right, with the scanner, you're scanning my naked body. So you tell me what I got in my pocket, buddy. Um, all right. Well, I didn't mean to have swearing, including in our, in our discussion. But, um, you know, people, it does take, like, state of mind and to be present to whatever's coming at you. And that's the whole thing that they're trying to do is to keep you from being present to your own thoughts and feelings. Um, and it's a challenge. Yeah, it, and it's funny how things kind of come together. I, I only started, I just started reading the Marcus Aurelius meditations. You know, I, I'm like in book two and I've kind of reread it. I'm, I'm having a hard time, well, I, I bought it in Spanish because I figured it was closer to the original Latin. But the, <laughs> yeah. the problem is I, I've got like ninth grade level Spanish, like I, every third word I have to stop and look it up. So I'm struggling. I should have just bought it in English. But he 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 talks about um, that it is in our nature to help each other. I mean, this is like right in the beginning, you know, recognizing that, you know, our, we're all kin, you know, even if we don't share blood or lineage, uh, we are all just brothers and we're meant to work together like the two hands work together or the two eyelids work together. And, you know, it's impossible to take offense because these people and ignorant and morons or however he describes it, the, the, the problem is that they haven't come to understand the difference between what is good and, and what is not good. But I who have discovered what is good and what is not good, I'm not offended by them. Something like that. You know, it's pretty well put, but it goes against nature is his point. Uh, we, we are meant to cooperate with each yeah, other. Yeah, that makes sense. And then that idea that understanding what's good and what's not good. And then, you know, what comes to mind is your Bill Maher show, right? Where they're intentionally trying to deceive people. Yeah. And it's understandable that that's not good. Maybe having some empathy for the person who thinks that that is good or, or that that's the way that you should behave. And, and maybe... I'm having a hard time with that right now for certain people in government and business having any empathy empathy for those people who are trying to run us over with their Marxism and um, 
all the other agendas that are in play. So it is difficult to get in touch with that. I agree. I, 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 it's a discussion I have with my wife often. I, I, I'm less angry at my neighbor or my, you know, the people that I see around me um, because I, I, get, I think I've gotten to a point where I feel more pity than not. They, they're so afraid. Man, these people are so afraid of this thing that they can't see. And, and it's so deadly that you need, a, you need a doctor's test to tell you you have it. It's just this <laughs> irrationality that they're living in, but they're so afraid, right? So, but then the people that are maliciously and knowingly doing it, I think they're in a different category. And uh, I told you, I'm not a religious person, but it's funny. That's been a lesson this year. It's like it, evil exists. Evil is real. And I can't explain these people's actions any other way. I find myself rubbing elbows more than ever with religious people. They seem to have, and and I and I, it occurred to me that the, the advantage that religious people have over, say, secular people is there's a baked in idea that evil exists with religion. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a that's a difficulty. Some of my secular friends they, they just can't imagine malice because maybe they, because they themselves are not malicious. Right. Well, they can't imagine that people are that different from themselves. And history has proven them that they are, right? And if you just do a good breeze through the Gulag archipelago, you can get a grip on what turns a person into the dark side or into evil, right? Um, and I, I do think that religious people do have an advantage in that area if they have been given an understanding of evil. And even from a secular perspective, the idea of morality and right and wrong can provide some guidance as to what is going on. But but it's hard to ascribe that level of evil to other people. And maybe that's where the big lie comes in. Um, like and, Hitler's big lie? Yeah, the big lie where the biggest lie, you tell that one because that's the one that people can't believe that you'd be so bold as to, to tell, right? And I think that's what's going on right now. Uh, the big, great reset lie. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. That's, that's, that's been interesting. So I totally have been looking into North Korea. Um, and it's, you know, whenever things come up, you know, so this, this, the, the sort of rebellions that even people living in the under that oppression have had, right? One of them is, well, it's communism. So you're not allowed private property, and it's against a lot of trade. So you know, people were getting jailed, but it got to the point where starvation forced them to just, everybody was trading, you know, whatever goods they had. It was a way of you know, lifting all boats. It's kind of amazing. I, I want to understand the details a little bit better, but anyway, black markets started operating. There were so many people disobeying the law that at this point, the government of North Korea just gave up. And now these markets just op operate on, you know, out in the open. Uh, because people had to survive. So even in that regime, there was um, some some form of, I, I don't know if you want to call it soft rebellion, and they were doing what people have always done, right? They had markets. And, you know, They're still human. And yes, Mary Rowe, my wife was talking about some dissident North Korean that she was saying that they didn't have the language of freedom. And so they didn't have a word for love or friend or other things that were not approved and, and uh, that kind of points back to gato and bringing the language down to 800 words and right. controlling people's thinking and you can see that with like if you watch the news they're starting to talk in text speak right so when people do text like lol or things like that uh, that's starting to creep into and why would they why would the news be pushing twitter a corporate entity unless they were getting paid um, to try to funnel people down those avenues. Uh, it was really interesting to me to see what they push and, and then to get away from those things. <laughs> so to leave, just to say, no, thank you. <laughs> That's not for me. <laughs> That's fascinating, Tim. I don't think I'd picked up on that, but it makes sense. Like when the president is using Twitter, like why is he using Twitter? Yeah, well, right. Yeah, that doesn't seem very presidential or dignified. No. Um, no. 
Yeah, I, I, I well, and it's funny because so once once you get to the point, you, if you accept social engineering and that there's international entities, corporations that control things across borders, so maybe the social engineering is global, then other things maybe. So like I've been wondering, it seems like everything's like a playground, right? So they they, they test things out. You know, the Soviet Union had that. I forget that it was one of their their leaders. You know, you take off his shoe and and wave it around at the UN. Like the guy was a joke. And Brezhnev, like, I think, yeah. It might, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, and then, so I don't know, as a way of discrediting their own institutions, or I, I'm not sure, it seems kind of over the top. But then I look at Boris, UK's Boris, and then, you know, the same disheveled head, he kind of looks like a Trump. Oh, Boris and Justin and yeah. Biden and Kamala, for God's sakes. I mean, they just kind of denigrate the the tradition or the office or the government. They, they put, and even with Trump and GW and uh, Obama being a Manchurian candidate. I mean, it's just a freaking theater farce or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I don't know if it's ever been real. That's the problem, right? Well, that's a fascinating thing. It makes you wonder how long we've been living with these parasites, right? I mean, about all these things that have happened, how many times have we gone through this? Uh, I think about what it might look on, like on the other side of the Great Reset. So let's say, you know, the average person goes back to being like a medieval peasant, illiterate, uh, and they retain all this technology, right? They will literally seem like gods to us, you know, flying machines and things we can't even exp begin to explain, you know. Have we gone through a cycle like this before? Um, I, I don't know, you know. Um, but what's, what's I, I, I don't know. Well, I think the medieval serfs and then, you know, ancient slaves i think the cycles continue and I, I think it's always been going on just like you said the ancient technology of human manipulation and psychology is occulted from us and i mean why are all the presidents of the united states related to the you know one king of england or something like that right it all kind of makes sense and, and so if you think about if you start to think about government as a mafia and like a criminal mafia that's just using this cloak of uh respectability or or society or or that they pick that up and they ascribe it to themselves and then people believe it but if you start to think about them as a mafia because they don't go to prison right nobody gets convicted they they put their fixers in to fix the trials and the commissions and the nothing ever happens. The only people who get whacked down are uh, the people who go against the mafia. Hey, you start to think about it as a mafia, then everything seems to make sense in that context. It starts to make a lot of sense, and then once you start to understand that it's global and it's corporations have no loyalty politicians have no loyalty to their to the people or to their country everything starts to like fall into place that model right yeah i think that one of the profound ways that, the filter that i look at it through and this is also john rapaport is that there's basically you know it's all a lie basically there's just the people that are one of what the people that want freedom which is most of us and then the tiny minority that want control so, you know, I'm looking at all these actions governments take and, you know, is it limiting, is it increasing control over me or is it decreasing control over me? And just looking at it through that sense, understanding that coercion is bad, right? So, you know, you're talking about government. Man, that was a tough pill for me to swallow. I guess a big mind-blowing moment, but it started with the idea of, you know, natural law, right? That that we all have inherent rights and and, and, and anything that violates my natural law rights is immoral. I, I could see that. So that led me to the conclusion that coercion amongst adults is immoral. And everything government does is coercion, right? I mean, by its very nature. So, so if, you, if you can't do that to your neighbor and your neighbor can't do that to somebody else, then how can you give somebody else permission to do that to you or to anybody else? Exactly. It's immoral. And it's force, fraud, coercion, and theft. And... It's because we're trained and brainwashed by that occult method since birth. So they come to people come to see it as legitimate. The the most dangerous superstition, right? According, according to Mr. Larkin. Yeah. Mr. Larkin Rose. Yeah, and and 
I've got to read myself some spoon arm because I've been listening to some of that as well. And that's very, very telling. If you just think about it as neighbor to neighbor, what are you permitted to, what morally would you do or are you permitted to do not taking into account evil, then <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's fascinating too. We we have who knows how many times freedom has spread around the world. We we just we don't learn about these things. And I can tell it's very controlled. Yeah, like Spooner, I, I need to re-listen to him. I honestly I, I think I heard him in I heard it in the audio version in one of the Peace Revolution podcasts, and that's been a while, so I need to revisit. But uh, it was also very important. And then, you know, I'm I'm you know, this this, this these ideas, right? And when you start questioning how legitimate government is and maybe why government the, the government needs to be under our control because <laughs> yeah. anything else is tyranny and not desirable and won't lead to good outcomes. It's illegitimate, right? So, yeah, well, I mean, this has been a fascinating discussion with you, Luis. I, th I really appreciate you taking and carving out the time. Um, it's always great to talk with you, you know, to try to get your point of view on when did you first realize that you were being lied to? <laughs> And then what do those lies consist of now and how deep is it? And it's really a kind of an endless well, unfortunately. And, you know, my wife is always like, would it just be better if we didn't know these things? And we were just like drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I was like, you know, I think those people are really going to suffer yeah. and I, I feel for them. And I don't want to be that, that person. I, I totally agree. Well, to back up, it's it's a I always enjoy this. Are you kidding? So anytime, <laughs> absolutely, I would love to keep doing this. I, I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we we struggle with the same things, right? We 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 see people walking across the street. And it's like, man, we are literally living in a different world. Yeah. But I can't believe that you're ever better served, you're, that you're ever not better served by having more information. And and the world makes sense. I mean, it's a way more screwed up place than I ever imagined before I started looking into it. But it's, I don't, I don't live in an incoherent place. And I think most of these people live in an incoherent place where things, not, nothing makes sense, really. What's happening in their personal life. Um, it's led to a lot of things. And maybe next time we can focus on the positive things of, of maybe waking up, I suppose. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's led to a lot of satisfaction in many other places, personal and uh, professional maybe. Yeah, I like that. I, I think that's a good idea to go with the theme of not looking at cockroaches all the time and taking the, yeah. the spiritual look at it and the good versus evil and the good that comes out of it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. All right, Luis. Well, thank you so much. We will talk to you again really soon. I look forward to it, Tim. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye.